Today I want to talk about how we can see crisis and trauma in the Vedic chart. I think it's a very important topic and at the end of this I'd like to go and show you how you can see this in an actual chart. I'm Ram Das Bill Sinclair, and I hope you'll like and subscribe to this video. So in addition to being a Vedic astrologer, I also have my master's degree in social work and work as a psychotherapist. And for many years, I worked in psychiatric emergency rooms in New York City, actually, dealing with people who were in crisis and really um, having a tough time. So I think it's very important with what we're facing in the world today to take a minute and talk about three terms, really. Stress is the first one. So it is through stress we are able to grow and to change. Because if there were no stress, we would just stay the same all the time. So we're all familiar with day-to-day -day stress, little things you have to do but to figure out how to do something that's new. It causes a little bit of tension, causes, you know, a little bit of discomfort, but we move through it and then after stress you feel like the release and you feel like, oh, I'm glad I got that done. And then we, so that's kind of our cycle of growth and that's kind of a normal healthy rhythm of growth. When we come to talk about a crisis, however, that's different. It's the next step up. It's when we feel um, it's an event or a time period where we feel intense stress and we may feel um, physical or mental um, anxiety and, you know, challenged. And we feel like we have to make a decision. And most often in those crises, we make what's called a fight or flight decision. So we either, you know, go, you know, we use one of those two paths to move forward. And actually the word um, crisis comes from the Greek word, which means to make a decision. Now, the third level is when we find ourselves overwhelmed by the situation we're in and we cannot make a fight or flight decision. And in fact, it comes to the point where we question, you know, our belief that the world is just predictable, ordered and reliable. And this is when we start to um, adopt what's called a freeze response. We can't get motivated and we become stuck. And when we do this, and this can be, again, physically or mentally, we oh, are, are experiencing or entering into the realm of trauma. And it has many different layers and many different manifestations. But what I found very interesting is that the word trauma comes from the Greek word, which means a wound. So something happens that we get stuck and we're not able to deal with, and it creates a wound that then we must work towards healing. And so we have to then take more active steps to recover from this trauma. So in our everyday lives, stress leads to resilience, coming up with a new plan and recovery. When we start to experience these other two things of crisis and trauma, we have to still remember that we're working towards um, engaging our resilient senses our resilient abilities and coping skills to move forward and do that. So kind of with that general outline, I wanna talk about how we can look in the Vedic chart and see times when um, the stress is likely to go into crisis or into even trauma and how we then even have a choice to either um, recover from it or to um, repress it. So, the three houses I look at are the sixth house, which is really the house of crisis. And then we look at the eighth house, which is the house of trauma, and it's more stuck. And finally, we look at the twelfth house, which is the choice to either um, recover, it's the outcomes of either repressing or um, uh, building resilience. So the sixth house I, I liken to the planet Mars because it's sudden, it's unexpected, and it's usually, it's very, very intense. And it's also the action to fight or flee. Those are very Mars type of things. 
In the eighth house, the karaka, the natural indicator of this house is Saturn. And so it's something where we really get stuck and it becomes very intense and we feel um, compressed and limited and not able to move past it. And then the 12th house is again, resilience. And that also, I think, relates to um, Saturn as well. So as we're looking at these three houses, I wanna point out that you can study them from the Lagna and also from the Chandra Lagna, the moon's rising sign. And that will give you some physical and also some mental um, reactions. And really what we're looking for is if there's a confluence, if there's an overlap in two of them, that's gonna give you a prediction, you know, or an indication that this is gonna be a little more seriously. So in general, what we're looking at is any planets that are in the 6th, 8th, or 12th. And we're looking at the lords of the 6th, 8th, and 12th. Now, if um, the, um, either of those planets, the planets or the lords, are ruling or in the third, the seventh, or the eleventh house, this actually indicates that the trauma may bring out um, more difficult coping mechanisms. So it's not a great sign for recovery and resilience. It can make the whole crisis deeper and harder to cope with. If, however, there, the Lord is placed in one of the trines houses, the first, fifth, or the ninth, or the planets also rule one of the trines, this just kind of gives an indication that they may be able to, in general, you know, uh, make it a little softer and use more positive coping mechanisms. The difficulty with the negative coping mechanisms is it tends to pile on more issues. As we're trying to resolve this, we're digging out of this, but we're creating another hole somewhere else, you know, that we then have to cope with in that way. So the sixth house is a great example of that because it's called the house of the Shadrapu. And what that means is that often this is where we find the emotions of jealousy, anger, arrogance, um, infatuation, lust, and greed. And so it takes us kind of into a lot of these negative emotions that don't help us. They just tend to compound the trauma. Now, if you have malefics in the sixth house, it can be good because their malefic energy can give you the strength to fight off, to go into the battle and win, you know. And that's especially in the fight or flight response, it, it makes you very effective. Benefic planets can, um, can be good in the sense that they may make the whole um, issue a little easier. You may be a little more flexible and able to deal with it, but ten, generally they don't do as well because they don't have the strength to really overcome this obstacle that has arisen. I mean, if it had just, if you'd been able to use your normal coping mechanisms, you wouldn't be in the crisis kind of mindset, which is the sixth house. So let's move on to the eighth house. And this is really Saturn. The eighth house is also the house of the subconscious. So this is where things get stirred up that we are not even aware of. And so they tend to manifest that way and they, it tends to be harder and harder to deal with. Um, any planet seated in the eighth house is going to lose its strength. So it's best if that house is empty. Now, the Lord of the eighth house also carries this energy. So wherever the Lord of the eighth house is seated, it's gonna show where some of these, this trauma, if it arises, is likely to be impactful. So um, if it's like, say, in the 10th house, then it may be if you the trauma could have something to do with your career or it may have you may come into a traumatic situation that negatively impacts your career. Saturn is the natural karaka of the 8th house. So wherever Saturn is seated, you always keep in the back of your mind that this could have he could have some negative effects. This is why he's one of the most malefic planets that we deal with, one of the reasons. I'm sure there's many more. But so that's kind of the eighth house. Now, the other thing that's interesting about the eighth house is it's third from the sixth. So ideas and thoughts and perceptions that come up in the sixth house manifest in the eighth. So all those negative emotions you've had in the sixth house, in when you go to the eighth house, they become compulsions, addictions, other long-term negative patterns that only deepen the trauma and only make you um, go 
further away from finding your balance and working your way out of it. So it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy kind of in the eighth house. In the twelfth house, there's some hope for relief, but the twelfth house is still a difficult house. The hope from relief comes from the idea that it's seventh from the sixth house. So it's directly opposite. And so what arises in the sixth can often be resolved in the seventh. And additionally, it's the fifth house from the eighth house. So the fifth house is creativity and um, it can then help you to engage, you know, some more positive, creative ways to work through the issues that have arisen in the eighth house. A lot of the things that we indicate uh, that are associated with the twelfth house give us an indication of ways to work through this. So there's acts of charity, which, you know, takes you out of thinking about yourself and thinking of others. There's spiritual pursuits. There's spending time alone and isolation. If you find yourself alone and isolated, like most of the world is right now, you then have a choice to, e to use that as a time of reflection and to really keep yourself engaged or sometimes, you know, we can't do that. Sometimes we just kind of slide down into feeling depressed and sad. And that's okay for a short term. That's a cycle. But so you can see how engaging the creativity and using all the things that are involved in the 12th house, the indications can help you to release it. Now, that's the, that's the ideal. You release it. The other thing is, is that it goes into the 12th house, which is the deepest, most, you know, hidden house there is, and it's just repressed. And then it stays deep within you, you know, deeper than the subconscious, all the way down into the unconscious, and it tends to influence your power and your patterns of behavior and your further actions. This is the difficulty with the trauma, is that it goes in so deep that you're frozen in that moment of time. And so you have to um, find a way to work with people or to, you know, get help so that you can release that um, fear, that frozen response. Because until you can let the energy flow through that, it's going to keep you stuck in place. So those are the major ideas about looking at the chart. Now, once you've studied the chart, you have to remember that the Rashi just gives the potential. So don't panic when you see all this. If you have a lot of planets in these houses, don't worry about it. You know, because where the, the events start to happen is when we look at the Dasha periods. So you will find periods where maybe you have one a Mahadasha period of one of the six, eighth, or twelfth lords, it's not going to be the whole period. So you're just going to be kind of aware that that sets a foundation. I found that if you look at the second level, the Bukti lords, you will start to see if the sixth, eighth, or twelfth lord is there, um, that these issues are likely to come to fruition. So especially if you have a Bukti, if you have the Mahadasha Lord and the Bukti Lord and the Antardasha Lord, all three of them active in the 6th, 8th, or 12th, this is when things start to fructify. This is when things actually come about. And on top of that, I always look at the transits of the time because usually you need to have some transit support as well. So it takes a lot of things. It needs to be in the, in the chart. It needs to be active by the Dasha system, especially Bukti. And then it also needs to be active by the um, transits. I'll also say on the book Ds, I don't usually go much further than the second and third level because by the nature of trauma, it needs to be long lasting. And the fourth and fifth levels are very quick. So if you have, let's say you have them all stacked up on the third, fourth and fifth level there, then that's going to be more like a crisis. You're going to see something that's going to come, but then it's going to move past it. It's the traumas that are longer lasting that can really settle in. And then the other thing we would always evaluate is the state of the moon, as I indicated, and also the strength of the Lagna Lord. So those are things that are gonna give you protective factors. So now what I would like to do is I'd like to go through a chart for you and put all of these factors um, in action and you can see how we analyze the chart. And I'm gonna go ahead and throw the chart up on the screen so everyone can see it. 
The chart I'm going to use is the U.S.'s annual chart, um, and this is um, from 2019. It, this is on the new moon in Pisces. We take this for the annual chart. And I'm looking specifically at how we could see the eruption or the beginning of COVID-19 in this chart. So you'll see the information there on the screen. It's the 5th of April, 2019 at 4.50 a.m. in Washington, D.C. Now I wanna note that this chart is only good for one year. It's only good until the next new moon in Pisces. And that just happened on March 24th of 2020. So we're looking at a one year period of time. So the first thing we see here is that Saturn, which we mentioned always has some indications of, you know, the eighth house is the ruler of the 12th house and also the ruler of the Lagna. But we see here in the initial chart that he's seated in the 11th house. Planets seated in the 11th house are considered to do very well. They bring in the results um, of all the things that come in. Now, because he's ruler of the 12th, this means he could bring us some issues with that relate to crisis and trauma. But the other thing we look at is let's look at the rulers of the 6th and the 8th. So we have here the sixth Lord is the moon. Now, by the structure of this chart, the moon will always be a new moon, which is the most malefic placement for him. However, it's only three ascendants that could come up that would give him um, the rulership of the sixth, eighth or twelfth. So we have to kind of check that off in our mind that the moon is new, but it's in the seventh house. It's ruler of the sixth house. And being placed in the second house, the second house is what we call a um, Marika house. And that literally means dead. But in truth, it actually can be a time of great change and great, you know, um, shifting in the, in the country for this chart. So we can expect that the sixth house may bring up some obstacles that will cause great changes in our life. And then finally, we look at the... Um, eighth house lord which is mercury because his sign of virgo is there in the eighth house and mercury is seated in the first house this whenever something is seated in the first house it gives it a stronger manifestation when it comes along so i want to start looking down the vimshotri dasha period and i want to mention that i have changed the vimshotri cycle so that it actually manifests the entire cycle in one year since this is a one-year chart, it's important that, you know, um, we get um, all the planets, all the Mahadashas will cycle through in one year. So, looking at this chart, on January 20th, the Saturn began his Mahadasha period. That's the 12th Lord and the Lugna Lord. And on January 21st, the first COVID-19 case um, in the U.S. was confirmed. This is a man who had been to China. He was treated and he was released um, after he recovered. So we start to see that up until Saturn, which is the chart Lord and the 12th Lord, had a Mahadasha period, there was really not a lot of attention, but we can see that the 12th Lord starts to give some results there. So January 21st, we see the, that uh, the first case was identified, but it's on January 24th, um, 2000, um, 2020, that Saturn moved into the 12th house in his own sign of Capricorn. Prior to this, he'd been in the 11th house, as I said. So now we see something kind of interesting. The Ascended Lord and 12th house Lord moves into his own sign of the 12th house. So we have the 12th Lord in the 12th house, which gives a more impactful um, energy, it kind of doubles it, and it gives a direct aspect, as it always would, onto the sixth house. And it's widely said that Saturn's aspect is even worse than his placement. So suddenly we have an aspect here onto the sixth house, ruled by the moon and Cancer. And if we think about the body for a minute, Cancer does rule the chest, and it's related to the lungs. So there could be some damage there to it, to that um, area of the body. Um, on February 22nd, so a month later, um, the 
Saturn moon Dasha begins. So we now have the 12th and the 6th Lord running in the Dasha sequence. And so this starts to then activate a lot more. We have two levels. So we can see how the, the idea of COVID was circling around, but no one was really taking it seriously. I mean, because we had had several scares before and it had never really manifested globally. But then on February 22nd, we got a second impact. And on the 26th of February, we had the first deaths in the US and this was in the um, Washington nursing homes. So we can see kind of how a pattern developed and it began to, um, to ramp up more and more. Also, I wanna point out that on January 21st, sorry, on January 24th, when Saturn moved into the 12th house, that was also the day of the new moon in Capricorn. So there's something here. So the sixth Lord was not only in the chart, but it was weakest. But on the day that Saturn, the 12th Lord, moved into his own sign, the moon, the sixth Lord, was at his weakest point in the lunar cycle. So you can see how we can start to see something's going on there with the sixth and the 12th. Then on um, March 17th, Mercury, Mercury began. So we moved out of the um, Saturn cycle and into the Mercury Mahadasha. And of course, that is the eighth Lord. And it was in mid-March that we began to close down many areas of the country. And so you think about eighth house is the freeze response. And literally the whole country was frozen and we began to you know, um, well, the um, shelter in place orders, kind of an eighth house um, kind of energy and feeling. So I hope this gives you a little idea about how you can study the sixth, the eighth and the twelfth houses. Look at their sign indications, look at transits to them, look at the Dasha periods, and you can start to see times that are going to be problematic for yourself, for your family, for your clients. And I also think that it helps in this time period that you can see, help people to understand how there may be strengths in those houses that are gonna help them to, you know, uh, counterbalance the stresses that we're seeing. Um, I hope you have found this helpful. I'm excited to share this information with you. I think it can be very useful in this time. As always, I'm available for individual consultations. If you would like to meet privately and discuss your chart, I'm happy to do that. You can go to my website, which is listed below. Thank you very much. Namaste.